Hello YouTube. Uh, so we've noted that uh, the problems with Hempel's model seem to stem from his avoidance of the concept of causation. Uh, of course, empiricists have principled reasons for being wary of causation. But let's put those concerns to one side and ask, you know, assuming that a good, good account of causation can be given, can we use causation as the basis of a theory of explanation? Uh, and this is the basic idea of the causal mechanical model. Uh, which has been developed by Wesley Salmon and uh, David Lewis, among others. Salmon's um, basic idea then is that an explanation of X uh, shows how X fits into the causal nexus. Uh, more precisely, uh, according to Salmon, there are two stages to explanation. First, information is provided about statistical relevance. And second, we develop a uh, causal account or a causal story based on the evidence in the statistical information. So what's meant by statistical relevance? Well, the claim here is that the uh, explanands should increase the probability of the explanandum. On the deductive nominological model, the explanandum must be highly probable given the explanands. But Salmon disagrees. He thinks the explanands only needs to make the explanandum more likely than it would otherwise have been. But it, it might still be very unlikely. So recall the syphilis paresis example. So uh, a bit more formally then, uh, if we take some population A, uh, some property B is statistically relevant to another property C, just in case the probability of uh, C given A and B is, uh, higher, is higher than the probability of C given A. So you read this here as the probability of C given A and B. Uh, I think that's fairly straightforward. Um, and this is just what we find with uh, syphilis and paresis. In the population of, say, adult humans, the probability, uh, you know, the probability that you have paresis, given that you are human and that you have syphilis, is greater than the probability that you have paresis, given that you are human. On the other hand, consider the uh, pregnancy birth control case that we saw in the last video. We have a population of males, and those who take birth control pills fail to get pregnant. Uh, so the uh, probability that you fail to get pregnant given that you are male and that you take birth control pills is exactly equal to the probability that you fail to get pregnant given that you're male, namely it's zero in both cases. The technical phrase here is screening off. Being male screens off taking birth control pills from failing to get pregnant. Uh, so we say that A screens off B from C um, when the probability of C given A and B is equal to the probability of C given A. Uh, given that John is male, the fact that he took birth control pills is irrelevant to his infertility. And notice that taking birth control pills does not uh, screen off being male, because the probability that you fail to get pregnant given that you are male and take birth control pills is not equal to the probability that you fail to get pregnant given that you take birth control pills, uh, because many women who take birth control pills do end up getting pregnant. When A screens off B from C, it may be that there is a mere correlation between B and C, rather than a causal relation. So screening off is helpful for, uh, for identifying spurious correlations. However, there can still be a causal relation in two ways. One is that B causes C uh, only by causing A, and there are no, that there is no other route from B to C. Uh, so, Unprotected, unprotected sex, uh, B, causes AIDS, C, only by causing HIV infection. Uh, H HIV infection screens off unprotected sex as a cause of AIDS. The probability of contracting AIDS given that you had unprotected sex and that you are infected with HIV is the same as the probability of contracting AIDS given that you are infected with HIV. Screening off also occurs when two events have a common cause. Two types of events occur uh, at different places, say, uh, but uh, occur more frequently than if they occurred independently. Uh, we would generally explain this uh, in terms of a common causal antecedent. So uh, a simple example is that in, in Yellowstone, say, there is a small geyser and a big geyser many miles apart, but it's consistently the case that when the small geyser erupts, the big one follows. Well, here we have a regularity. There's no obvious connection. So we would propose a common cause of the two events. It's a causal fork like this. The uh, pr probability of the big geyser erupting, given 
this common cause and the small guys are erupting is equal to the probability of the big guys are erupting given the common cause. Um, you know, so the, uh, the, the common cause uh, screens off the small geyser erupting from the eruption of the big geyser. The eruption of the small geyser is, uh, it, you know, becomes irrelevant, basically, once the common cause is known. So uh, once we've established uh, statistical relevance, uh, there are different kinds of causal relations that might obtain. There might be a uh, connection between uh, the two events directly, or we might be looking for a common cause or, or something. Uh, so uh, let's consider the notion of cause in a bit more detail. Salmon uh, defines uh, what he calls a causal process. Causal processes are spatiotemporally continuous and are capable of transmitting information. Um, that is, they are capable of transmitting a mark. Suppose we have a beam of light shining on a wall and we block part of the light, creating a shadow. The shadow is not capable of transmitting a mark. Let's say you try to modify the shadow. Uh, you might, uh, say, shine a second light onto the centre of the shadow to make a donut shape. If the shadow moves, the modification will not move. I mean, unless you move the light as well, right? But if you just move, if the, if the shadow alone moves, it, the modification will not move. I mean, similarly, you could try to paint the shadow, for example. Uh, again, the shadow won't retain that mark if it moves. On the other hand, um, consider the light beam. If you alter the light beam at, at some point, so you know, by applying a filter so that only blue light gets through, the rest of the beam will become blue as well. So if you alter the beam at that one point, the alteration is transmitted through the rest of the beam. The beam from that point onwards bears the mark of the interference. Similarly, paint a mark on a billiard ball, it continues to carry that mark. You can't paint a mark on a shadow. So shadows are pseudo processes, not true causal processes. But pretty much every standard object around you is a causal process. Second, there is causal interaction. Um, so in this case, two causal processes intersect and the structure of at least one of the causal processes is modified. Think of the collision of two billiard balls. Uh, in that case, energy will be transferred uh, and the velocity of the balls will change. Or uh, you know, a lion attacking a gazelle, or rain pattering down on your head, or a ribosome moving along a strand of um, mRNA and synthesizing a protein. These are all causal interactions. So we can say that X explains Y uh, when, uh, first of all, there is uh, statistical relevance. Uh, X increases the probability of Y in the sense discussed earlier. Uh, second, X and Y are part of different causal processes. Uh, and third, the causal processes interact uh, in such a way as to bring about Y. Uh, so uh, an explanation of, of uh, some event involves citing the causal processes and interactions that led to that event. And in particular, uh, there's no need to mention laws. We can talk about causality without laws. Uh, of course, the complete causal story may require laws, but we often don't give, give the complete story. Um, very, very often explanations will be incomplete, um, as I'll discuss later. Uh, so th th this is of, of some benefit because causal relations are easier to discover than laws. Uh, this is the case for the man who developed paresis. We can show that syphilis is statistically relevant to paresis and we can give a causal story about the effects of uh, syphilis on the body so that we understand how it might lead to paresis. Um, the, the, the causal processes here are the human body and the bacterium uh, Trepamina pallidum. The causal interactions involve the way the bacteria invade the body and how they affect the body once they're established. This explains paresis. Doesn't really seem to be any appeal to laws here. Instead, we're appealing to causal mechanisms. For Hempel, uh, remember, scientific understanding is simply a matter of expectability. An explanation is an argument with uh, you know, the same logical structure as a prediction. But Salmon says that to, to understand requires more than just knowing the future, it requires more than being able to expect something. He asks us to imagine a uh, Laplacian demon, um, which is able to perfectly predict future events, but nothing else. This demon knows every particular event that has happened and that will happen, but it lacks a distinction. 
between pseudo processes and true causal processes. It would know all the regularities of the world, but it would not be able to appreciate the role of causal processes and causal interactions in producing the regularities of the world. And Salmon thinks it would thereby uh, lack understanding. So, so Salmon says that philosophy of explanation needs to pay attention to uh, the, the causal structure of our world. Hempel's model, which attempted to merely give the logical form of explanation, you know, logical form that could obtain in any possible world, that was misguided from the start. Causation matters. So it's worth uh, going through a couple of the characteristics of causal explanations. At first, Paul Humphreys draws a useful distinction between contributing causes and counteracting causes. A contributing cause of, cause of X will increase the probability of X. A counteracting cause of X will decrease its probability, it will tend to block X. In almost any event, there will be contributing and counteracting causes. Let's say that uh, a man wearing a condom nevertheless contracts HIV. We want to explain why he has HIV. Well, the condom is surely going to be relevant to the explanation. The fact that he was wearing a condom, which uh, would have acted as a counteracting cause, gives us a deeper insight into how he contracted HIV. Uh, we would need to say he contracted HIV because his partner had the virus and the virus entered his bloodstream despite the fact that he was wearing a condom. And this might point us in the direction of further research. We would want to know you know, why is it that condoms sometimes fail? How could we make them better? Uh, and so on. So we, we, you know, in tracing the causal processes that lead to the HIV infection, we need to pay attention to the way that HIV uh, overcame the condom. Uh, a second uh, characteristic of causal explanation is that the causes of uh, any event are always multiple. Um, contracting HIV, uh, that will involve a certain sex act, it will involve certain uh, biochemical states of the victim, biochemical states of the virus and so on, uh, or think about uh, the rate of a chemical reaction. That's going to be affected by enzyme concentration, by the concentration of the substrate, by temperature, by the uh, pH of the substrate and so on. Uh, these multiple causes are separable in the sense that each cause can uh, in principle be isolated and manipulated uh, on its own. It's easy for, in the case of a chemical reaction, right? You know, because we can we can hold all the other cause, causes steady and manipulate only the enzyme concentration or manipulate only the temperature and see what effect that has. Uh, it's a bit more difficult to do in the case of something like HIV, but in principle, it seems it would be possible. Finally, the causes of an event can be traced back indefinitely, potentially to the beginning of the universe. We might say that uh, the enzyme uh, caused the rate of reaction to increase, but then something else caused the enzyme to be there. Maybe I put the enzyme there. Well, then something caused me to put the enzyme there, and so on, back indefinitely. Um, and this uh, is an important point because it entails, uh, as I mentioned earlier, causal explanations are necessarily highly incomplete. We can't communicate all the different causal factors that influence an event. Uh, we might make uh, new discoveries to fill out the explanation further, but we'll never be able to give a complete explanation of anything. Uh, the causal chains are just too large and complex. And this raises an important question because you know, it's clear that when we ask what caused X, some of the causal information is highly relevant, some of it is less relevant. Uh, so suppose a, a, a cholera outbreak occurs in London, and I ask, you know, why did this happen? Why did cholera hit London? I might say, because a water company violated sanitation regulations, allowing pipes to become degraded, and the water was contaminated. Well, okay, uh, you know, maybe we'd need more details there, but that's a pretty good explanation. Or I might say, oh well, cholera hit London because on the 27th of July 2010, John Smith drove his car into London. That wouldn't explain anything. Uh, but that may well be part of the causal chain that led to the cholera outbreak. Let's say that John Smith is the CEO of the water company and he drove his car to London in order to attend a meeting on the maintenance of the water system, where he decided to allow the pipes to deteriorate rather than spend money fixing them. So, you know, I've, I've cited a cause there, but that doesn't seem like a, a much of an explanation. So the question is, how do we distinguish explanations that are merely incomplete 
but that still produce understandings from explanations that are simply useless? Well, obviously there isn't an algorithm for this. We can probably point to some general constraints. Uh, so for one thing, we tend to look for causes that are distinct to the event we're trying to explain. A man driving his car to London is is nothing special. It happens all the time. It could lead to any number of things. Uh, it doesn't have any appreciable effect on the probability of cholera outbreaks. Recall that one of the points of the causal model is that the explanands must increase the probability of the explanandum. And, you know, I mean, it doesn't seem to be much evidence that a man driving his car to London uh, does that. In, in the, you know, it doesn't, that doesn't increase the probability of cholera outbreaks. However, um, in, in general, whether uh, particular causal information is relevant is going to be context dependent. So, you know, I, so, so I ask, right, why did the cholera hit London? Well, we can't answer that in the abstract, right? Any question like this will have a, a particular context and that will draw attention to different aspects of the causal history. Yeah, so we have to disambiguate this question because we might be asking, well, why did, the, why did cholera hit London? In this question, we're looking for information about cholera versus other diseases. What was special about cholera? There are many other diseases that might have struck, so we want to know something that distinguishes cholera in, in particular. Or I might ask, why did cholera hit London? In this case, we cite specific features of London that made it especially susceptible to disease. You know, the failure of the water company leading to poor maintenance of sanitation infrastructure. That has nothing to do with cholera specifically. So you can see that these uh, two different questions give us very different uh, explanations. Um, and you know, an obvious consequence of this is that uh, there, ca <clears throat> there can be more than one true explanation of an event. If the uh, explanations cite different sets of causal influences that, you know, and, and, and those Causal, influence di causal influences did in fact influence the event and they are relevant given the context, uh, then both explanations can be true. Uh, and you know, th th there are probably lots of debates in history and psychology and biology and so on uh, where you know, both sides are right, where actually both, uh, you know, the, the, both debating sides give different explanations to an event, but they're both correct. Uh, they're both, they've both identified uh, causal, important causal influences. Uh, so final uh, point is the causal mechanical model explains particular events, but we often want to give general explanations. Why, uh, for example, does the aurora happen? Here we're not asking for an explanation of one specific aurora event. We want to know why does this type of event happen, the aurora in general? Well, David Lewis uh, says, we can give uh, general explanatory information. So with respect to auroras, the causal histories of auroras may be very much alike, in particular the final parts of the histories. In all auroras, uh, charged particles of the solar wind are captured by Earth's magnetic field and directed into certain locations of the atmosphere. The charged particles ionize the atoms of the atmosphere, so they cause those atoms to lose their electrons. And when the atoms regain an electron, the electron loses energy by emitting a photon, and that's the colour we see. Different atoms and molecules emit different colours. So that's general explanatory information about auroras as a type of event. Uh, what I've just said there is, is, is common to the causal histories of all, uh, or at least most, auroras. Most sciences uh, will appeal not to general laws, but rather to general explanations of just this sort. We can give um, general explanations of, uh, you know, why certain people commit domestic abuse, or why diseases hit particular populations, or why, um, you know, extinction events hit certain lineages, and so on. Intuitively, as we discussed in the last video, none of these explanations seem to involve appealing to laws. Um, so, arguably, the causal model fits these cases better. Uh, right, we'll, we'll look at some objections to the causal uh, mechanical model next time, but that's all for now. Thanks for watching.